Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining the MLOX Live webinar series. We're really happy to see you here, and we're really excited to be back after a short summer break. My name is Sahar. I'm the VP of Marketing at Iguazio. And with me today are Yaron Haviv, co-founder and CTO of Iguazio, and Adi Hirstein, VP of Product. And today we're going to take you through a quick um, discussion about real-time feature engineering with a feature store. Uh, we'll be talking about the challenges associated with real-time feature engineering, both in training and serving environments. We'll talk about how feature stores enable collaboration across teams and projects and how they accelerate the path to production, making things reproducible, making things a lot easier for data science teams. We'll talk about building a real-time ML pipeline using production data and ingesting and analyzing real-time data as a part of that. And we'll talk about the importance of integrating the feature store with model monitoring, with real-time serving for a complete end-to-end -end operational pipeline. Um, before we get started, I wanted to invite you to join our community. We have over 500 MLOps, uh, data science, and uh, data engineering practitioners who are sharing information, sharing knowledge, um, and keeping the discussion about MLOps uh, alive and kicking. So we'd love to see you there and we'll drop the link in the chat uh, in momentarily. Uh, during the session today, we'll be sharing two polls with you and we'd love for you to take part. These polls help us make these sessions as valuable as possible uh, for you. So uh, please do participate in that. If you have any questions at any point in the conversation, feel free to drop them in the Q&A uh, section and we'll make sure to address them all at the end. We'll leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Adi to get us started. All right. Thank you very much, Sahar, and hi, everyone. Really excited to be here again. Uh, it's really exciting topic, so uh, looking forward to it. Um, I think when we look at the, uh, the market today, uh, we can see that there are many more and more use cases that are real-time by nature. So uh, you can see across different verticals like finance and healthcare and manufacturing, you can see those uh, real-time use cases are coming in place. And as a, as a vendor, we can basically share with you that we can see those use cases coming up with lots and lots of uh, uh, customers and, and prospects uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, if you will. Now, uh, if we move on the, uh, to the uh, next slide, the, the common denominator of those uh, use cases uh, are the fact that they're based on real-time feature engineering. So those are the type of use cases that you cannot really do with batch processing. So for example, real-time recommendation. If you want to predict and, and provide a product recommendation on what's gonna be the next article for a user, you need to be based on the last X articles that the user has viewed in his last session. This is something that you cannot really do uh, overnight. You cannot really do it as an ongoing process. You can only do it if you have the, the live data, the real-time data to process the real-time feature engineering for this model. Another example is order optimization. If you want to estimate how long the food delivery will take, obviously you need to take out, under account the incoming on orders and how many outstanding orders per minute have been made in the past hour. Those are the type of information that you don't really have uh, uh, as a batch uh, information for batch processing overnight. This is only thing. Uh, this is only uh, uh, the type of processing that you can do on live data, and that's why it's very, very different the uh, real-time feature engineering and, and the batch processing. In some cases, you also have uh, uh, characteristics like uh, location. So you have the uh, the mobile app that are sending the ID with location. And then you need to calculate the, uh, the distance between the current location of the user and the, the, the shops uh, that he wants to, you know, he needs to purchase. So uh, at the end of the day, those are the type of uh, information that you can only process live. You cannot really do it as a batch processing. Now, if we move on to the next slide. Now, why is it hard? I mean, what, what's the, the issue of real-time feature engineering? And why is it hard in, in terms of, you know, technical aspects uh, to do it versus uh, batch processing. So first and foremost, the data scientists are not data engineers. So when the data scientists have you know, a mission, basically their mission is to develop the best model, the best algorithm. They don't really have a production state of mind because that's not their job. At the end of the day, they need to come up with the best and the optimal uh, model. 
But once they have that model, what really happens is that they need to take that model and kind of you know, throw it over the wall to the data engineers. And now the data engineers needs to rewrite the code in order to deploy it in production. So the data scientists don't have this production mindset and that's why they actually need to take the code and, and basically move it on to a, a different disciplines, different uh, uh, data engineers or de DevOps in order to deploy it in, in production. And also in production, uh, in, in those type of uh, uh, real-time future engineering, you need to work with different sources. So for example, you need to work with Kafka as opposed to working with Parquet files or CSV files. So usually data scientists are used to work with those uh, static files, but in production, the reality is different. You need to work with streaming sources like Kafka and Kinesis. It means that you need a different mechanism. You need a different coding in order to process your data. And then performance is obviously another big challenge because now you need to calculate lots of transactions that are coming in in real time on live data, and you need to do it at scale with very low latency uh, so your application can actually get the data uh, pretty fast. This is very, very different than you know, batch processing because with batch processing, you typically take a data frame, a pretty big data set, and then you run some calculation using things like uh, Spark, but in this case, you're actually uh, uh, need to calculate the, uh, the features in real time on many transactions. So it's, it's a very different uh, set of uh, processing. Now, when it comes to transformation, another big challenge is aggregations on sliding window. So again, when you do it uh, on batch processing, you have your data frame with timestamp and everything is already set. But in, in production with real-time feature engineering, you actually need to calculate those sliding windows, and that's a pretty big challenge. And we've seen lots of customers that are still using SQL. Now, SQL is great for analytics, is great for a batch processing, but it, it's not really suitable for taking transactions in real-time and calculating those uh, aggregations on sliding windows, because at the end of the day, you need to get the data from a very fast key value and that's a very different mechanism than SQL because SQL usually goes <laughs> against the LDBMS database and has different characteristics of data processing. Now, another challenge is uh, data enrichment. So you have the real-time events, but now you need to enrich that with historical or operational data. Again, you need to do that in real time. Very, very different than doing it uh, uh, during a batch processing. And the consistency between training and serving. You need to make sure that your training and serving data is the same. Otherwise, you may end up with a model skew. Uh, and let's say that you have a model in place. Now, how do you monitor that? How do you make sure that there is no drift? And if there is a drift that is based on, on feature drift, you need to basically be able to compare the uh, features that are running in production and the features that were trained in your feature store or where, wherever you uh, train your features in order to identify that drift. Now, let's say that you've done all that and you created a beautiful feature, how do you reuse it? How do you make sure that in your next project you can actually reuse that feature again and again? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to do with real-time feature engineering per se, but with real-time feature engineering, it, it makes it more complex and, and more uh, important to, uh, to be able to actually take that feature and reuse it in your next project. And then last but not least, the fact that you have a model in place doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, you're not going to upgrade it. So at some point you're going to upgrade the model, you're gonna upgrade the versioning. And now those models uh, can be associated with a different data pipeline. So we need alignment between the feature and the model version in production. And that's again, much more, you know, complex when it comes to real-time feature engineering, because with real-time use cases, uh, you actually uh, uh, you need to be, um, you need to reduce the risk so your application uh, won't be impacted by the fact that you're upgrading those uh, models. So those are the challenges that we're seeing uh, for real-time feature engineering that are very, very different than uh, the challenges of you know, batch serving. Moving on to the next slide. Now, in addition to the uh, real-time feature engineering uh, challenges, we have this, you know, uh, generic challenges around operationalization of machine learning. So we mentioned the fact that we have, you know, data scientists and we have data engineers, and there is a silo 
in uh, between those data scientists and data engineers and, and DevOps. Um, it's not like, you know, they're not talking to each other. Obviously, they're talking to each other, but they're working with different mechanisms and different environment. So, for example, you know, there are all kinds of platforms for uh, collaboration between data scientists. But if you think about it, those platforms don't provide you the ability to collaborate between data scientists and data engineers. So at the end of the day, once the data scientists are done with their part, they need to kind of you know, throw the code over the wall to the data engineers in order for the data engineers to be able to take that code and deploy it in production. So they're working with different tools, different environment, and that makes this process more complicated. Now, once you have the code and, and the code is basically done, how do you take it to production uh, in terms of actually running it in a, a distributed cluster? So there is a lengthy process to do that. You need to package the code to, to run it in some kind of a distributed cluster like you know, Kubernetes, and you need to take care for things like scalability and test it and put it or edit as part of your CI CD and take care for versioning and monitoring, all that kind of stuff needs to be in place. And that makes this process, again, much more complex. And then again, we have this uh, uh, complexity around the feature engineer that we just you know, mentioned. And last but not least, the fact that you have the model doesn't mean that you know, it's the end of the game. You actually need to monitor that model uh, on an ongoing basis and identify if there is a, a model drift. Now, if the model is not accurate, how do you identify that? That's you know, the first question. And then once you identify that, uh, what do you do with it? How, do you can, how, how can you actually identify the root cause um, if the root cause is based on data drift, for example? This is yet again something that you need to be able to uh, identify and based on that, re-trigger the entire uh, training process again. Next slide, please. So we kind of talked about the, uh, the challenges and, and the issues. Let, let's talk about the, the solution. So we believe that the, uh, the right solution that really address those type of challenges is a very robust feature store. Now, as you can see here, feature store is basically a, a component that is at the heart of the operational pipeline. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, all kinds of data sources, like operational databases, data warehouse, data lakes. And then we have real-time sources like uh, Kafka, Kinesis, and, and data that is coming from application as, as live data. And then those data basically goes to uh, this uh, feature store component. And the feature store has the ability to, first of all, connect to those you know, different types of data sources, and then transform the, the raw data into features uh, and basically run those you know, feature engineering part in real time in order to, to make, make it as you know, features that the model can be served from. And then there are also the, the notion of uh, uh, searching features, uh, putting it uh, in a catalog so users can search features, reuse features and so on and so forth. Uh, and the, uh, the other piece here is that once the features are ready, you want to be able to serve the model uh, as part of your model serving and also as part of your training. So this is where the feature store you know, basically resides in that you know, pipeline. Now, let's talk about the, uh, what, what are the characteristics of, uh, of a good feature store? What are the main benefits that you would expect to, to see from uh, such a feature store? So first and foremost, the fact that uh, the feature store can actually work with real-time sources like you know, streaming and live data and be able to do this real-time feature engineering is obviously very, very important. This is what you know, it's all about at the end of the day. And let's kind of you know, separate between streaming and live data. Live data could be uh, data points that are coming from your mobile application, like your user ID and location. Streaming data is an ongoing data. It doesn't necessarily mean that the data is actually live data. It could be data from you know, the last uh, 30 minutes or last hour, but it, it's coming as stream. And you need to be able to process that data uh, using uh, uh, you know, sources like Kafka and Kinesis and those type of streaming engines. So uh, the first thing that you are expecting from a feature store is to be able to uh, process this real-time uh, data and, and do this you know, real-time feature engineering. Then you have the ability to define the logic once. And once you define the logic, the same logic is applicable for both uh, serving and training. 
And that's very important because if you think about, you know, typical process without a feature store where data scientists are running the you know, feature engineering staff and creating a pocket file, when you need to deploy that in production, at the end of the day, you need to create the process that takes that data and put it in a very fast key value. So a good feature engineering, a good feature store basically does it for you. So you define that logic once, you define the, the transformation and the metadata and everything. And the feature store basically takes care to write it down as pocket file for a training and also as key value uh, records in, in a very fast key value database for serving. And that basically reduces the time that it takes you to uh, create those you know, feature engineering processing. Now, another important point is the fact that you want to make it easy. So you need to have a very simple SDK to define those feature engineering. So even if we're talking about sliding windows and aggregation and joints and all that kind of stuff, you want to be able to uh, empower the data scientists to define those uh, feature engineering parts using a very simple SDK. So they don't really need to go to the uh, data engineers and rewrite everything using Spark or any other you know, processing engine. So that's, that's a, a very important point. Now, another point is uh, the fact that you want to tie the, uh, the feature that will trained in your feature store and the, uh, the model monitoring uh, capabilities. So when you want to identify if there is a, a model uh, drift and you want to travel uh, shoot that and be able to see if uh, the model drift is based on data drift, it means that you need the ability to compare between the features that are running in production, the feature vector itself and the labels, and the features that were uh, yeah, that you were trained in the uh, uh, training environment. And if you identify that there is a deviation, then it basically means that you may have some drift based on that feature. So for instance, if you uh, train the model based on a feature, let's say called age, and the, uh, the range was uh, between 20 and 40. That was your training data set. And now the reality is that in production, uh, most of the users are above 50s. Uh, if, you, if you're able to compare between the data in production and the data that was trained in your feature store, you can easily identify that there is a, a deviation, that there is a, a feature drift. Now, let's say that you identify that there is a feature drift. Now you want to create a new model, right? You want to retrain everything based on this uh, drift. Now, one of the, the, the important you know, benefits and capabilities of, uh, of a good feature store is the fact that you can actually create a snapshot of the uh, feature vector and the labels in production, create that as a feature set in your feature store. And now you have a feature set that is based on production data. And whenever you need to retrain the data, you can actually do that on production data. And the feature store does all the mechanism and the automation of uh, collecting the data and, and storing the data uh, for you. And, and that's, again, very important point in order to kind of, you know, close the loop on the entire life cycle uh, once you re-trigger a retraining process again. So those are the kind of, you know, the, the key points that I would look at when, uh, when I look at a feature store that is suitable for uh, real-time feature engineering. And next slide, please. Now, how does it work in terms of the flow? So you have the, uh, the developer, the data scientists, they define the, the logic of the transformation with all the, the metadata and, and the, uh, the, <coughs> the transformation logic itself, which is essentially things like uh, the type of the sliding window aggregation and the formulas, the joins, the different columns and, and so on and so forth. And then they play around in the development environment uh, in order to come up with the right set of features. Let's say that they found the, the right set of features. Now they need to move on to the, uh, the production phase. They need to deploy that as a production you know, feature set. So this is where they, they have this mechanism to basically automate this uh, uh, code and convert it automatically to a high performance serverless engines that can run on the production data. So the idea is to make it very, very simple and smooth for the developer. And once they have that you know, processing engine in place, at the end of the day, it ingests the data to two places in the feature store, ingest the data to uh, the online feature store, which is essentially a very fast key value. 
and also to the offline feature store, which is you know, based on a parquet file uh, for the most part. So no, now you have the serverless engine transformation that does it for you as an ongoing basis. And the ingestion, the data itself goes to those uh, two places. And the next step is once you have those feature set, you can define what we call the feature vector, uh, which is this you know, object that creates the set of features that are going to be used by you, your model. And the feature vector can, com can be comprised for many, many features across different feature sets. And the feature vector can be used for both training and serving. And this is how you make sure that there is, there is no skewing between the training and the serving because the same logic goes to your you know, uh, model training and model serving. Next slide, please. Now, this is an example and your own in his demo is gonna show you obviously uh, an end-to-end -end demo with lots of other examples, but I thought it would be nice to see how easy it is to actually create this real-time transformation. So on the right-hand side, you can see a, a real-time transformation graph. So you have the source of the data that could, that could be based on a database or a file or a streaming engine. And now you have a transformation graph that does all kinds of processing. In this case, uh, it's, uh, it's running a data extractor, you know, taking the data and extracting it to you know, hours of the week, and then running some uh, map value, one-note encoding, and, and uh, sliding uh, window aggregation. Now, in order to do that, you can take a look at the uh, left-hand side, uh, there are only you know, a few lines of code in order to actually create this real-time feature engineering. So it's pretty simple. You create a graph, you define those steps, like you know, one of encoding and uh, aggregation and all those steps that you can see here. In a few lines of code, it basically generates those serverless uh, components that are running this processing as an ongoing process, and that can run on live data in real-time. So this is how you know, simple it is to actually create those uh, transformation graph. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the other point is that once you have the, the model in place, as I mentioned earlier, it's obviously very important to uh, monitor the model, making sure that the model is actually running properly. So you have uh, this mechanism to you know, basically view the state of the operation, the operational state of the model. So you can see uh, the uh, transaction per second and things like you know, error and latency. But then you can also see uh, whether the, there is a drift based on the fact that there is an integration between your model monitoring and the feature store. So if you identify that there is a drift, you can re-trigger the, uh, the entire you know, pipeline again. As I mentioned earlier, one of the, the most uh, important thing that actually uh, and make it uh, uh, possible is the fact that uh, the feature store can actually create the, uh, the feature vector and the label as a feature set. And now whenever you have a drift and you want to retrain the model, you have a snapshot of the production data and you can train the data on real you know, live production data and essentially uh, create a new model. And, and then again, you know, test the model, make sure that the model is actually better than the existing model and gradually deploy that model in production. And obviously when it comes to real-time use cases, uh, there is you know, more risk around that because if you're making you know, mistakes, uh, uh, the, the impact on the business could be huge. So you need to make sure that you, you're able to actually reduce the risk as much as you can. Okay, next. I think it's a kind of a summary, yeah. so. Yeah, so I think, you know, to summarize, uh, a real-time feature engineering is, is complex, but with the right toolbox, you can address all those challenges and essentially deliver very robust real-time AI services in, in a very efficient way. So with that, back to you, Sahar. Thanks so much, Adi. Biron, I'll uh, hand it over to you. Great. Uh, so uh, Adi covered the, the need and, um, and how it should work. And and what uh, I want to show you is, uh, is how it really works and, and also take, take you through um, an example of a fraud detection application. Uh, before I, I show you the demo, let's cover a couple of slides just to understand how this all works. Um, you know, in the, in the standard implementation, you have people, you have 
uh, data engineers that go and, and use tools like Spark Streaming and Flink, and maybe someone needs to build some glue logic and implement it as a container in some Kubernetes cluster. And then that feeds into a model serving engine and that model serving engine may, may generate some events and have another container that handles those events and maybe another thing that on the side that sort of monitors everything and, and does the analysis of the accuracy and drift and so on. And that's a lot of work and especially if you have to duplicate it for offline and online. So essentially what we're going to show is how you can implement the logic once. The, the logic could actually incorporate different things. It doesn't have to be only like structured data analysis, you know, things that Spark or Flink can do like grouping and join. It could actually be manipulating, you know, JSON files. It could be even deep learning. Uh, we won't cover it in this example, but NLP processing, etc. You could build very versatile uh, pipelines and you implement them once, and then you could use the same pipeline, whether it's in the notebook or in the production line in real time, in offline. And the general idea is that you have sort of serverless functions that materialize that pipeline, that implement that pipeline, and you build some logic that is essentially a set of transformation, gets data, uh, does a set of transformation, and then generates an output. And um, in order to be efficient, it also has some stateful caching. Uh, I won't dive into it too much, but I could essentially build that logic and initialize it in a notebook and then like feed it with a CSV file and then just generate the training set and use it for training. That's easy. We could do it even at bigger scale and use jobs and Spark or other tools to actually implement that in a much more scalable manner. Uh, but then we can also use real-time data, like data coming from Kafka or HTTP sessions and so on, and build exactly the same training set because we have the same logic. The logic is decoupled from the way you're ingesting the data. And you could do even more interesting things instead of writing the data into uh, like a parquet, you can write the data directly into a stream and, and use uh, and do model serving directly off of that data in real time, low latency, and all that without writing a single extra line of code, just developing something in a notebook and deploying that to something that runs in real time in high performance. And you could also build other applications like, you know, build dashboards directly off the features. Uh, this is, and those dashboards could actually also be used for, or this uh, time series analysis could also be used for things like model monitoring and uh, drift analysis and so on. So all of that is using essentially the same implementation saves uh, tons of work, just you know, talking about uh, drift analysis and, and all of that. So the data that by using the, the feature store in, in its uh, form, then essentially all the data, all the analytics on the real-time implementation is gathered automatically for you. So you can essentially see the features in real time. You can apply you know, triggers on alerts and, and, and all of that. Now let's go into the, the demo that I'm going to show you. We're going to take a financial fraud application example. Uh, this is a very common application, almost any financial institute and not just in finance, you can find this application. Uh, let's assume we have a set of transactions of swipe, swipe transactions on Swipes' credit card. We have activities around the user account, you know, logs in, logs out, changes passwords, et cetera. That gives us indication about the kind of activities the user is doing. We may have some other static data information about the, the customer, uh, his zip code, his age, and so on. And we want to build a fraud analysis application that takes this data and builds the features. And those features are used to decide in real time whether a certain transaction is fraud or not. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to tap into the different sources of data, you know, the credit card transactions, the activities, static data, et cetera. We use, it, we use the serverless functions to do it. Uh, but those service functions are instantiated for you. You don't really implement them. We'll show how it works. Uh, those functions are indexing and generating the different features from those different sources. Once it's in the system, someone can just open a notebook and start exploring the production data and try and make some sense out of it. Uh, when we want to do training, we can essentially generate a snapshot of the training data, uh, run uh, AutoML, uh, 
model optimization, et cetera, on that uh, data set, which generates essentially a model. And that model uh, is generating a special serverless function that is actually uh, serving that model and potentially also doing the feature engineering part and uh, validations and all sorts of logic that you want to put into that function. That serving function, it doesn't need to figure out too much how to handle with the features. It's getting a, a URL of the feature vector and it's just going to fetch it in real time. Every time uh, a user request is coming, it's going to enrich it with the feature uh, vector data and serve and respond to the user. In parallel, every activity that happens in the service uh, serverless function is being tracked automatically by a model monitoring entity. That entity is detecting anomalies, drift, accuracy problems, you know, all sorts of problems with the data. And it also writes back the production data into the feature store. Why is that important? Because we want to retrain the model every week or a few days, depending on the, the level of accuracy. So once we return all the production data back into the feature store, then we can just go and retrain the model uh, just as well from the production data. We don't need to do that manually. Uh, and we can also build other applications on the same data. So now that you get through the application, we need to show how we're doing the ingestion. We're going to show how we're going to do uh, the training. And then we're going to show how we do the, the serving, all that in, in three, uh, three notebooks. And so uh, I hope everyone sees my, my screen. So the first thing that we want to do, we want to develop the features. What does it mean develop the features? We have raw data. The raw data is the credit card swipe transactions. And we want to start building interesting features like aggregates and uh, all sorts of groups of information and mappings and encodings of information, which will make it data ready for machine learning. So uh, this is an example of our transaction uh, data. The transaction data looks something like that. We just have like for every customer, uh, it was uh, you know some enrichment of customer data, uh, information about what kind of purchase, the amount, um, category was he buying shoes or travel or whatever. So we have that the data set. This is an example of a, of a data set which is uh, public, and we want to take that data and turn it into meaningful uh, features. So we want to do things like it's very important the hour of the day where the transaction was made or the day of the week, which indicates you know weekend or weekday and so on. Uh, then we may want to do age groupings. You know, certain groups of age have different behaviors. So we want to map the, the age into a set of, of categories. Uh, we may want to do some encodings for different things for the categories, like is it buying shoes or travel? We want to do some one up encoding on that. And then we want to do aggregates. Essentially, we want to take the amount of data and see for you know, how much is it buying per day? How much is it buying uh, per, per hour, maybe per category? How many shoes have you bought you know, recently and so on? And, um, and also aggregates per category. So like uh, how many uh, things you bought for a certain category or how many transactions you've made of a certain category. Like, if you're traveling uh, to, uh, if you're doing travel 10 days, uh, 10 days uh, a month, that's probably a problem if you haven't done so until now. Um, and, and then we want to materialize that data into online, sort of a NoSQL implementation, high performance NoSQL implementation for the scoring. And for training, we want to create sort of snapshot data in our Parquet files. So in order to do all of that, which is usually takes a bunch of a uh, few months, you know, we've engaged in a project where it took them three months just to prototype that using Spark and Hadoop and all that. They didn't really finish after three months. And uh, this Im implementation was done in a week and uh, it was sort of fully complete. Uh, so this is just an example of the amount of time and energy you can save. And also we're gonna see that you, we don't need to be an expert data analytics uh, engineer to build that. So we just have a logic that we want to apply, the aggregation, the mappings, encodings, et cetera. So we just describe it in a graph, a graph sort of a, 
uh, DAG, you know, so we're going to say, you know, when we are going to get the data, we want to do some data extractions and value mappings and encodings and aggregates and so on. We're just going to describe how this graph looks like. So the first thing we want to extract the hours and days of week. Uh, we want to do some mapping uh, of the values based on age. We want to do some encoding uh, on some on some of those mappings, the category and the gender. Uh, we want to build aggregates for the amount for different our hourly windows and different statistical um, uh, functions, maybe build aggregates across the count of the type of transactions. So all of that I've described in you know, 10, 20 lines of code. You can visualize it and we could just run a test with some test data and build a feature set. So this, see immediately I have immediate feedback. I don't need to go and re-engineer everything, I immediately see what the features look like, you know, with the aggregates and everything. And if I think that, you know, it's not good enough, I can just go back and do some changes. I can add my custom Python classes or functions uh, and can do all of that and generate my features. So this is producing the features. I can repeat the same for other data sets. This is for the user activities. This will be sort of a simpler pipeline. Again, a few lines of code building a pipeline uh, and ingesting it. I could do it for labels. You know, we would need for training, we would need labels. So, yeah, you know, we want to do some, uh, some work to extract labels into a feature set. So this is another data set that's created. Um, and we can ingest those, those labels. After we've finished that, the, you know, doing it in the notebook, then immediately, if you go to, to Amazon, you know, which is an open source framework that implements all of that, uh, we can go into the, the feature store, uh, feature store. And here we can see that the three data set that I was talking about are actually here. So we can go into uh, the features. We can see the different features that were generated, including their metadata. Uh, we can add labels and validation policies, et cetera, that will be used uh, in order to search for features or validate features and so on. We could look at our you know, pipeline. We could look at actual snapshots of the data. We can understand the statistics of the data. We haven't written a single line of code that does it. This is all happening automatically. And the statistical analysis of the data is very important because that will be used in order to analyze if our model is behaving properly and is accurate and there's no concept drift around it and so on. And all of this data is done automatically and generated automatically for you. And this is across all the different uh, feature sets that we've, we've used. So I can just go and play around with my notebook and build all those feature sets and save them in the database in a version uh, category. So every feature, by the way, has, has versions. Currently we're only working with the latest release, but I can create tags and and versions, and which is very important if you're going into production, being able to work on server development release while you have a production pipeline running and so on. So once I've designed that as a data scientist and I tested it and it's, it's a sort of a fun and, and everything is working, I can just go and deploy it as a real-time pipeline that listens on an actual stream and build those features now in production. So. In order to do that, we just generate a serverless function by just calling the deploy ingestion service, giving it the feature set object that we defined earlier by the data scientist, some execution configuration, like uh, you know what kind of Docker image we may want to use for packaging, and uh, maybe some um, some other information like the triggers we want to trigger from Kafka or Kinesis or some other stream. We just a very small configuration and we run it and we have our ingestion pipeline up and running. No refactoring of the code, no go, not going to Flink and Spark streaming and all of that. We've designed it in our Python and we could just take our feature set object, which is a, an abstraction of all our pipeline. And we just, you know, uh, turn it into a real, real time running service or a scheduled uh, job. Okay, so once we've done that, we can go into uh, the training section. But here we're going to do something which is beyond uh, the standard. We're also going to do feature optimization, not just feature, uh, not just generating a model. 
the first thing that we need to do is, you know, we're loading our product with all its feature sets and, and all its information. And, uh, and then we, we want to build a feature vector. We can do that feature vector from the user interface just as well, you know, going and just taking the different features and selecting them and building a feature vector, which later on is going to appear here. Uh, we have a couple of them that we're going to see here. Uh, but we can also do that through the SDK. We just set, generate the list of uh, features that we're interested in, so the feature set dot feature or any feature from a feature set. But this will automatically list the features and when and we can save that feature vector, which then shows on the UI, as you can see. And we can use that feature vector later in serving or in other applications. If we want to get the view or sort of the snapshot of the feature, the feature vector, we just call get offline features. Uh, and that will automatically materialize a view of the, the features that we can use in our projects. When we're doing this get offline features, it's actually a very sophisticated operation. It's doing different types of joins across the different feature sets. It's taking care of something called time traveling. So making sure that the joins are based on the right timing. So if I have, have a certain swipe transactions and I want to see the, the current balance of the customer, the current balance must be the current balance at the time of the swipe transaction. All those details are taken care automatically for you by just calling the get offline features. You're getting a data set and you could just visualize that data set. That data set is joined across the different features with all those feature engineering aspects built into it. So it's essentially ready for training. I don't need to do any additional work on it to, to work. We just sort of uh, can train off that data. And we can also do that on production data, not just on offline data. Um, so we are using here in part of ML Run, the framework that where we, we developed uh, you can also run different types of jobs, including ML, uh, ML ops jobs, auto ML jobs, feature engineering jobs, and so on. So we're going to run uh, auto ML job using a marketplace, sort of a pre-baked uh, marketplace is essential. Uh, in the ML run market, you have many different built-in functions for doing many different uh, tasks. So you don't need to necessarily implement a function. If you just say, you know, give me auto ML, uh, I want to give you some parameters like type of algorithms I'm interested in, uh, some goal functions, et cetera. And this will just you know, feed it as an input. I'm going to give it the transaction feature vector, which has sort of a UR, unique URL and, and run the training. And just running this will generate, will essentially run the training and generate a model. Uh, so if I go into the camera to my project and look at the models, I can see that I have essentially uh, three models that were generated because I have three algorithms, okay, uh, you know, from using different algorithms each, and everyone has his own accuracy and you know lots of uh, other data and charts and all that. That was generated automatically uh, from that uh, job. Okay. So I ran it and I got all the data. The problem, I still have lots of features. Maybe I don't really need all those features because getting a feature requires processing, requires joins, all of that. Uh, if you can use this, if you can get the same accuracy with less features, that's always great. So what we're gonna do now, instead of having this uh, very large feature vector, we're gonna try and shrink the feature vector using an optimization function that part of the, fun of the MLRAN function marketplace for feature selection essentially takes the, the model, it takes the features, and it tries to find which features are the most influential on the results of the model. And um, so the only thing we need to give it is the feature vector name and some, some information, and that's it. That function is gonna run and is gonna generate uh, all sorts of statistics and, and charts, and eventually generate a new feature vector, which is reduced, is shrinked, we just gave it a, you know, we told it the output feature vector needs to be dash short. So if we're gonna go into the, again, the project, it will go to the short. We'll see that we're only requesting uh, five features and those five features will generate the same accuracy that all those other features generated. 
Okay, because all of those, most of those are, are meaningless. And so we can take the new feature vector and now run the same training that we ran before, just this time with the, with the shorter uh, feature vector and, uh, and get the new more optimal uh, model. And you see the accuracy essentially is pretty much the same, 99.93. So almost the same with a, a, you know, a third of the or a quarter of the number of features that we used originally. So you see how you can automatically build all of that optimization. And now we want to deploy the, the real-time pipeline. So again, it's not that hard. Again, we're loading our, our project on the notebook. We can build a classifier a function, which is a serving function that classifies data. We don't have to, by the way, because again, in Amazon Run, you have pre-baked classification functions for most uh, frameworks. Uh, but just to see how it works, you build a classifier that inherits some class. It has a load and a predict. Load is where you're loading your model. Predict is where you're sort of conducting your prediction. Uh, all the model monitoring, all that is built into those classes. You don't need to implement anything. One thing I've added here is a, a print, just because uh, it's doing too much magic. So I want to show you behind the scene what's really happening. So I build a classifier model. And for, for scoring my, my plot. And now I'm building a graph topology. I'm going to use a relatively simple graph topology, but you can build a much more sophisticated one with data preparation and validations and so on. What we're building here is a graph topology of an ensemble of three the three models that we generated. So in order to do that, we're just creating a simple, what we call router topology. We're giving it the router. A router is the thing that dispatches the requests and collects, and etc. cetera. But this router is a special, what we call enrichment router, that it will get, for example, the customer ID, and it will send to the models already the enriched feature vector uh, for, for, for those customers. And uh, for example, which feature vector we're going to use for enrichment is the one that we just generated. It also does auto imputing. Uh, and you see that I'm essentially telling it for all the columns imputed by the mean value. How does it know the mean value? Essentially, it goes to the feature store, says, for all the features, give me the mean value, and I'm going to substitute all the null value, all the non values that you'll find that, you know, where especially working with aggregates, you, you find a lot of windows that are empty and you have non values. So you have to do imputing. So the imputing here is built into the, the ensemble uh, router. You don't even need to, to write a piece of code. You could even choose different imputing strategy for every column or feature and so on. So I'm essentially choosing a, a router of an ensemble with enrichment and select, I'm adding all my models is child under that router. And that's it. Now I wanna simulate this topology. Again, think about how much engineering you should have done in the regular work. I'm just going to create a mock server, which is a simulator that simulates the, this entire topology. And I could just give it a sample of a customer ID from our table and run a test, just feed it with a customer ID and run a test. Now, remember that one, one thing that I did there was printing the input to the predict method. I'm pushing a customer ID, but you see that what got, got into the prediction was actually a vector of four values. Where did those come from? This is actually the feature vector with the imputing because the actual values are, are empty. So it was substituting the, the non values with the imputing uh, value. And you see three prints because it essentially went to the three models and eventually responded with the prediction, which is uh, class zero uh, and that's it. So what did it do behind the scene? Behind the scene, the enrichment uh, ensemble, it got the feature service that we gave it and it just gave it the source and returned all the values uh, from the feature vector, uh, because there are sort of some non-values, then the non-values were substituted by the mean value. Okay, so all that black magic is already behind the scene. If you want to use it directly, you can, but a lot of that black magic is already built into the pipeline. And now that now everything is ready, I want to deploy it into the cluster. The only thing I need to do is I can save it and deploy later, or I can just say deploy. And that essentially builds all the containers, build the, the pipeline, the real-time pipeline for me. 
and deploys it into the cluster. And then I could just go and start running requests against the real live cluster. So all of that work, you know, think about how much engineering should have been involved. This is all done single notebook with not too many lines of code. And all of that could also be automated. I can build a pipeline. This is an example of a, an auto automated pipeline, which is using Kubeflow, if you're familiar with. Uh, so I can build a pipeline which automatically uh, prepares the data, run the training, run testing, and then deploy the model or even run training and then model selection and then training again and testing. I could build sophisticated uh, graphs of, of, uh, for development. And by the way, all of that could be triggered directly from a Git request or from any trigger, a schedule trigger. Uh, when you identify a drift, you can let this uh, run on, on the event of the drift and will regenerate the models, uh, regenerate the features, and it will substitute the production pipeline as a whole. One of the problems today that when you have model serving, one guy is doing it and feature engineering, another guy, how do you change a version? If you, you can't just change a version of a model without changing the feature engineering and the APIs that lead to that model. So how do you version everything? So here, because it's a single pipeline that does it all, you could just deploy the entire pipeline as a single entity with rolling upgrades and so on. So with that, uh, we can go on and on, but I'll stop here so to leave uh, some, some time for questions. Thanks so much, Yaron. That was great. Um, just before we start with the Q&A, and I see that there's already a couple of questions here, I do want to go on to our uh, next call. So Yaron, if I can just share my screen. Sure. Uh, let me unshare. Excellent. Thank you. So we're moving on to our second poll and we wanna hear from you whether you currently have a feature store. Okay, great, thanks very much. So I can take some of the questions uh, that have been, been asked. So uh, first question yeah, is uh, how could we work cross-platform? Uh, would you want to say training uh, is Spark based, we don't have Spark. So uh, first, uh, what I showed you, it works with multiple frameworks. So just if you want to work with Spark, by the way, everything is, is documented if you go to the MRN documentation site at mrn.org. Uh, so you can use Spark as an engine. If you're using Iguazio, then you have a managed Spark inside. If you use things like Databricks or others, you can use uh, them as well. Uh, or also even machine learning frameworks. Uh, we have some nice demos showing how the training itself happens in Azure ML or in SageMaker. So we do the snapshot of the, of the feature, feature vector. We upload it and register it, for example, in Azure ML, launch the AutoML in Azure ML and grab back the models and feed them, and feed them into the, the real-time pipeline. So it's very open architecture and you can mix and match different components. This is to address that uh, question. Yeah, I'll just read the second one for the benefit of everyone listening. Uh, do you have any recommendations for architecting the data sets to make them applicable to multiple problems? For example, get features in three in third normal form. So uh, you've seen that the part of the pipeline that I build, I use classes as you, I use like the one of encoding class, I use the uh, value mapping class, time, and, time encoding class, et cetera. Those are essentially clusters that are written in a certain convention and allow you to, to manipulate fit. So, and you'll find that there aren't too many such transformations that are used. Uh, I think like between 10, 20 major transformations for like in, imputing, you know, dropping columns, uh, sort of time, different time alignments, et cetera. So you can store those uh, classes uh, and, and then reuse them across different pipelines and just apply parameters. You've seen that every, of the, every one of the classes is used. You can also have parameters, uh, register parameters, and then just inject the parameters. So this way you can reuse the same component in almost any application. We've seen customers that adopt, adopt, adopted this technology that the first project took them a little bit of time, but the second project was much faster and the third project was much, much faster because they essentially reused the same components across all the projects. Great, so I'm just moving on to the next uh, question. Uh, there's a question here about Keras deep learning model, if you can comment on that. 
um, so we have we actually have a nice pipeline that we're uh, working with. The one is in the in the examples. There was also a question here: Are these notebooks available? So uh, currently, there there's a different set of notebooks under the MLRun documentation uh, of the feature store, uh, showing uh, I think uh, healthcare data or uh, stock analysis data. But the one that I'm showing in a few days, it's going to be replaced, substituting the others. Uh, we can send an email, SAR, to the people with the, with the link. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, up updated. So that's uh, on that. On the deep learning. So the pipeline, the, the feature engineering part is not limited to uh, structured data. There actually, there is an example in the documentation of an NLP pipeline which uh, does a uh, PDF document extractions, you know, converting it to text and taking the text and running uh, uh, NLP to extract entities and, and sentiments and taking that and indexing it in a database and so on. Uh, there are other pipelines, for example, for like video streaming that uh, you, you cut it to images, you take the image, you, you run sort of uh, different transformations like resizing the image, converting it to black, white, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, you know um, uh, movements on the picture to increase the data set for training. Uh, then even after the after the model is being served, you take the results and you create masks and you do anomaly detection. So you can build very sophisticated uh, pipelines. These are just examples from things that our customers are building. So it's not really limited to machine learning. And uh, we have plugins for Keras, PyTorch, etc. That automate. Most of the work, uh, we'd love to show you that uh, to follow up, follow up with us. Um, we'll just take so one more question. Um, what's the comparison between MLRun and other solutions? For example, Feast and other open source solutions. Okay, so in terms of the feature stores, there aren't many. Uh, Feast is sort of one of the first ones, but Feast does not have two major components here. It does not have the transformation logic. Basically, think of it as sort of as a catalog that has the real-time view and the and the offline view. You need to figure out how you're going to ingest the data into FIST. So you don't. So this is the major uh, the major thing about the, the feature store that we've built is that you create some abstract definition of the pipeline, and then you can deploy the same pipeline in any form and shape in real time, in in offline and online, and using different engines. The other thing is, is that. FIST doesn't have the integration with the model with the model serving and the model monitoring. And you've seen how powerful it is that I can just pass a URL, the feature vector URL to the serving and that's it. I don't do any feature engineering in real time. I don't need to think about all the details. And also the model monitoring, the model monitoring takes the feature vector URL and it already knows how to uh, do the drift analysis because it's taking the same feature set with its two views with the real time view and the uh, and the offline view and just doing a real-time compare, if you think about it. And you could build very interesting applications, uh, not just accuracy and drift. So like in, in deep learning, there are applications like figuring out if the, the pictures have a skew, color skew, for example. Uh, so by having this integrated approach where you have the model serving, the model monitoring, and the feature store, and also the automated transformation, and underneath you have a serverless engine, so you don't really think about infrastructure. You just say, here's a business logic, make it run at scale. Uh, it's, a, it's a much uh, uh, much better approach, we believe, and it saves significant amount of DevOps and data engineering efforts, et, et cetera. It's not just a catalog like some of the other implementations. Great, thanks, Yohan. Uh, there's a couple of questions here about whether the session is being recorded. Yes, it is. And we will share the link with you gladly uh, tomorrow. So you'll receive an email with, with the link to the recording. Uh, regarding the notebooks, if you would like to receive links to the notebooks, the best way to do that is to just ping me on our Slack community. Uh, all the resources that we have go on there and that's the best place to get in touch. So we'll share the link in the chat again right now. I see another um, question also, here around the hardware and infrastructure. So yeah, all let's, of the let's take that last one. <laughs> We're nearly so out of time. All the infrastructure is essentially running on Kubernetes, uh, whether it's Kubernetes in the cloud or Kubernetes on like virtual machines like VMware on-premises, depending when where you like, or even managed Kubernetes like GKE or EKS or AKS or all of that. 
uh, and there is some something that we do in order to improve the performance, including handling of hardware acceleration technologies and things like that. Excellent. Uh, so we are running out of time, uh, so we'll take a pause at this uh, point. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to, free to uh, ping us on Slack and we'll be happy to, to answer. Um, I do want to point out that we have a lot of uh, MLOps resources available for you on our website. So if you go into iguazio.com, we have a section on MLOps with blogs, with videos, with the previous sessions of this webinar series, uh, many of them where we have guest speakers from different companies that discuss challenges uh, that they face with their MLOps processes and speak about their MLOps journey. So we do invite you to visit our website and check out all of these resources. And at this point, I do wanna share the poll results as promised. So we'll start with the first poll. We'll just share that now. So the biggest challenge you have around real-time feature engineering, most of you said calculating complex features. Uh, which is not surprising to us, right, Yaron? <laughs> uh, yeah. We see that quite a lot. It's it's a very often uh, it's very often the, the major challenge. Um, followed by in-house skill set manpower, teams working in silos, uh, and so on. And about twenty two percent of you are not currently working on feature engineering. Um, we'll go on to the next poll. So we asked whether you currently have a feature store and 61% of you do not, uh, which is also not surprising looking at kind of the, where the industry is right now. It's still quite a new solution and many enterprises are looking into the best uh, route for them, uh, the best route forward. So excellent. Uh, with that, we'd like to uh, thank Adi and Yaron very much uh, for this presentation and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing the conversation on Slack and of course to seeing you on our upcoming MLOps Live sessions. So thanks very much everyone for joining us today.